Good morning, everyone. I know we're hitting you just before the lunch break, and I'm very conscious that we've overrun. Um, don't worry, we will. I've made the executive decision. This will not be a 45-minute panel. Uh, we're not going to keep you from your lunch for that long. I'm very grateful for the invitation to moderate today. I'm very grateful that we've got a very interesting um, panel. It's always nice to have a combination of people from different aspects of the maritime industry. We've got from the owner-operator side, the bank side, from the sort of research side of things, and also people, someone who's able to give us you know, some insight from the governmental point of view um, based of his involvement with the different sort of um, chambers that he's involved in. The title of our panel today is The Future of Shipping. So not so much is there a future or not. Hopefully there is, otherwise we would all be in trouble. But what, do, what is the shape of the future? Without repeating too much either, what has been covered in earlier panels or later, let's keep this nice and interesting and hopefully punchy. Now, I'm very pleased today to introduce to you our panellists. First, we have Mr. Michael Parker, who is the Global Head of Shipping and Logistics from Citibank. Dr. Martin Stopford, you would have heard um, earlier this morning, giving us a very interesting presentation. He's from Clarkson Research. Jeremy Nixon, who is the CEO of Ocean Network Express. Dr. Nikos Sakos, who is the President and CEO of Sakos Energy Navigation. In addition to that, he's also the um, Chairman of Intertanko. And finally, Mr. Espen Poulsen, who is here, um, and he's got various hats on. Um, he, is, he is the Chairman of the International Chamber of Shipping, President of the Singapore Shipping Association, and also Executive Chairman of NSL. Gentlemen, thank you very much for agreeing to be on this panel. Now, in terms of the future of shipping, I mean, some of the points were mentioned during the Game Changers panel discussion. We'll refer to some of those, but not necessarily going to any in-depth discussion. I think the one thing, the first thing I'd like to raise here in terms of the changing environment is on the regulatory side, that as much as we may hate it sometimes because of what it imposes on us uh, and the daily impact it has on the work that we do is incredibly important. It's not just the environmental regulatory environment that has changed and it's continuing to change, but as you know, the banking environment as well, and both of those uh, impact the industry that we're in. Now, the first person I'd like to sort of um, ask is um, Espen. Given your you know, position you have particularly within the sort of International Chamber of Shipping and also the Singapore Shipping Association, could you give us some insight as to sort of the, uh, these policies, how they came to force, but also what's the feedback been from the membership? Has there been sort of resistance? You know, how do they see it affecting their business? Thank you, Madam. I think first of all, there's two issues. The, the, um, the, low, the low sulfur in January 2020, many people hope and pray that this will in fact not come, not be, uh, become a reality. Everything that we know in here is that it will become a reality and that we need to, to get ready for it. Um, some people are taking a scrubber route, some people are um, wringing their hands, some are believe there will be supply. At the time, some believe that, uh, that, they will, that, that they will have to go to 0.1% distillate uh, rather than the 0.5% blends in case that's not available and so on. But the, the reality is it's going to happen and um, it will, of course, affect the price considerably of, um, of fuel. So this is in a way interlinked with the CO2 discussion because, uh, because in bringing down CO2 um, and, and facing higher funding prices, owners are highly incentivized to burn less fuel. This is very obvious. And the, the, the things like the EEDI index has indeed brought some, uh, some uh, benefits to 
and some improvements in the sense that we're, we're consuming about 8% less as an industry uh, since 2008, whereas trade has actually increased about 30%. So the EDI as an initiative has been successful and, and there's room for further improvement in it. But all in all, um, we are not going to reach these ambitious targets, and they are very ambitious um, in time, unless there is a major shift into fuel, be it, um, be it uh, renewable uh, powered, uh, battery powered by renewable energy, hydrogen cell fuels, um, and then as an interim, uh, LNG and biofuels. It, it just won't happen otherwise. I, I personally have a view that the ingenuity of mankind is such that there will be a fuel that we may not even be able to visualize today, but it, it will happen. But in the meanwhile, all these other initiatives, uh, building up to 2023, we will, we will by then have a much clearer roadmap as to what the IMO expects of us. But, but to really, to, to, to summarize, the recent, the recent um, intercessional and MEPC meeting reached an agreement in a way against all the odds. And I think it's a tremendous achievement for the industry, the, the, the impact that we've had and the, the willingness that we've shown, bearing in mind that we're not part of the, we're not part of the Paris Agreement. We have in fact created a, a shipping Paris Agreement. And I think that most people understand that we have to do this and, and we will do it. And I think the, the achievement of reaching a, a consensus IMO puts the IMO itself in, in a much better light because it shows that something can be done if people and countries are willing to compromise. And I think our industry associations ourselves, in Tanko, Pimco, and all the other associations who help towards this progress, uh, to, towards this process, can take a certain amount of pride in what we achieved in reaching this agreement. Thank you, Aspen. And Nikos, from your point of view and from an owner's point of view, what are your considerations when you're trying to decide, okay, how do we deal with this? You know, do we, you know, which options do we go for in terms of dealing with this? Um, whether you want to install, sort of you're looking at installation of scrubbers or do you have a gas alternative? And also then do you look potentially at, you know, if I want to then sort of sell the vessel, do you look forward to think, okay, how does this impact, if at all, on sort of the resale or the residual sort of value? I mean, your input from the other side would be incredibly helpful. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, we find ourselves uh, in, the, uh, in a very interesting crossroad uh, as, the, as an industry. Uh, this is not a tanker-specific issue. I think it's an industry issue. Uh, we strongly believe as, uh, as uh, Intertanko <coughs> that uh, our, our clients should be the ones providing the right uh, fuels to run, to run our ships. Uh, so we are not, uh, we cannot, uh, of course, influence any of our members. A lot of our members or some of our members are going for scrubbers. We believe that uh, uh, through low, slow steaming and uh, planning ahead for the uh, 0.5 sulfur uh, availability, mm -hmm is something that we will be able to achieve. So uh, when we say that we, we, we are, some people are doing nothing, and this is the majority, I would say, of our members, it's not that they're doing nothing. They're planning ahead to use the, the right uh, distillates uh, when the time uh, arrives. Uh, the, the scrubber technology has not convinced us uh, that is the correct technology right now. It might develop to be correct. Uh, I know that a lot of the oil majors uh, in the next five years will be able to provide uh, ample capacity of, uh, of 0.5. So it's a matter of timing, uh, how you're going to deal with it, if you want to put scrubbers on your ships. Uh, I think by, by retrofitting also scrubbers, it's a good thing for the industry in a sense, because it takes a lot of capacity uh, uh, and uh, out of the industry in order to achieve this. I, I'm not sure this is the, the right measure to, uh, to take, but uh, uh, from uh, our, the majority, the vast majority of our membership are, are planning uh, to use the, uh, the right distillates. Thank you. I mean, we've certainly already seen it in relation to um, some long-term COAs that we are helping a client negotiate. 
I mean, two of the things that were specifically requested in terms of the specs was that the vessels be LNG ready and that if requested that there would be scrubbers installed. Then the interesting thing, of course, is then it all boils down to who pays for that depending on what option it is, not just the actual, just not just the cost of that, but also the downtime that would be required to uh, achieve that. So that we definitely see is already um, going into the commercial contracts that we see. Uh, Michael, if a known sort of um, people, came, parties came to you and said, listen, this is the impact that it's going to have. This is the cost um, that we're going to face for having to do this. Um, is this something, you know, is this something that they could say, listen, could you, would you be prepared to finance that cost as well in addition to the asset itself or, you know, whether on day one or part of the sort of working capital facility because clearly um, they're going to have to find the finance somewhere for that if it's not out of own equity. Uh, there's, there is no shortage of money for investing in improving the quality of shipping or the meeting of regulations. I think the, there is $164 trillion of debt floating around the world, which is a bigger issue. And we'll talk about shipping finance this afternoon. But I think the, if I can come to really the topic about regulation coming from an industry that has had a significant amount of new regulation in the last 10 years and paid over $100 billion of fines for having not met the previous regulation, which, which, of course, should have been enforced, maybe that would have saved a lot of us a lot of trouble. Um, I think this industry should embrace regulation. One of the key things about the IMO decision, if it hadn't made that decision, what would we be talking about? We'd be talking about how disgraceful shipping is because it shied away from doing everything else that every other industry is doing. I think, the ch I, I think we should all embrace regulation in order to get the right regulation. I found the dry bulk panel very interesting because this is, a, this is an issue for everyone, including cargo owners. The cost of regulation has to be passed on. Ship owners have borne most of the costs historically of change, and I think in the end the consumer has to pay for that. Um, and they have to understand why they're paying for it. Now, what's happening is... It's not just about regulating shipping. It is whether it is the effects of change through technology and digitalization, all those things that change business models. But the issue of shipping and what it does to the environment, if you like, the trade-off that globalization has to recognize is that everyone involved in, whether it's government or private industry, whether it's public or private as companies, faces the same issue. So, banks are signing up to sustainability agenda. City has signed up to a sustainability agenda put, put, agreed at the G20, which Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, leads about the impact of the environment on the portfolios of banks. So this is not something that shipping can deal with in its own way. Every other form of provider of resources, in this case banks as provider of capital, have to address the same issue. So we are, we are all in it together, and it's all, it is therefore very important that we all get that regulation right. It will be financed. There is no shortage of the money. But what will not be financed, I think, going forward, is people who don't meet those standards. So it isn't going to be an option. If you don't meet the standards, then you won't be part of the industry. But it will require not just the ship owners. It will require the cargo owners to help reinforce that. And we see. <clears throat> increasingly in, in big companies' uh, CSR policies, this issue is there. So I think you know, we're moving, the industry moves the global supply chain. Every physical thing that moves by sea is part of what the global consumer uses, whether it's energy or finished goods. And, and we're all part of that, that one system, if you like, which new regulation will help improve from an uh, emissions perspective from an efficiency perspective and I think you know banks will play their part in that. Thank you Michael. I mean just uh, also linking it to the discussion we had about I mean Singapore um, in particular Singapore's position as a leading bunkering port uh, not just a position but in terms of the quality of the bunkers here and being able to trust the quality of the bunkers that are supplied through here. 
I would have thought that having something like this is also something that Singapore can capitalize on given its you know, reputation. I mean, we've seen even just in the car industry not that long ago, where, you know, there were concerns that people were being fined because um, bits of equipment was being sort of fiddled to give the right reading. So I think that's something definitely given, um, you know, Singapore's position and its reputation as, a, you know, as a place where you can get, you get what you are asking for and what you pay for. And in order to help these companies meet those requirements, I think that's something that's very important. Uh, coming to the another sort of um, point in terms of looking at the future of shipping, this was referenced in an earlier panel, and that's the issue of consolidation. We've seen lots of it. The question is, will there be more? I hear mixed... Um, views from people as to whether or not there will be more, and if so, in what sector. Uh, Martin, could I pass, get your thoughts on that? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's a perennial issue, and over the years I've watched companies grow big and um, struggle. Sometimes we have long discussions with their CEO over lunch over how you get more value out of the bigger company, and it's... Um, very often they end up getting into specialist areas. I think the, the problem that um, we have had with the shipping industry over the last 10 or 20 years is that a big company is a consolidate, a st a still essentially a consolidation of one ship companies and there isn't really enough central leverage to give you a great marginal advantage as you um, grow the, the company bigger. And I think as someone said on the panel this morning, I mean, the average shipping company in the world today is uh, about 5.5 ships. If you take the, uh, if you take out the one-ship companies, the legitimate one-ship companies, of which there are about 13,000, then you get five, about 5.5 ships is the average. The, I would say the most popular size is 10 to 15 ships, which seems to me a very good size because you can know what's going on and, you know, the world is still a tough place and you, you know, you need to know what's going on with your ships and um, if you're not going to get ripped off by somebody. And so 15, 20 seems a good size. And then the very big groups, um, you know, you look at someone like TK who has ended up diversifying into specialised areas um, having done a lot of strategic work on this. So I think that you know, I'm, I, I think it's a tough thing to get a lot of real economic value out of growing conventional bulk shipping companies. Having said that, we, we've all heard probably more than we want to hear about digitalization this week, and believe me, you're going to hear a lot more. But um, I, I think one of the things that's occurred to me over the last year or two looking at the digitalization model is that... Um, I think there is a good chance here, uh, and incidentally, this was reinforced listening to the charters this morning. Um, the charters are looking for more value added, and um, I think there is a very good chance that as companies build up greater capability digitally, um, that means the opportunity to manage more than just individual ships, but to actually manage fleets more like a transport factory which, incidentally, some of the traders, I think people like Glencore, were quite good at doing in this. You know, they, they understood that you could trade, you know, you could buy the cargo and make the money out of the freight at certain times in the market. And so, um, so I, I would suggest that, um, that, that people might view digitalization as a way of building um, an overhead and a monitoring system that w which would enable them to actually see where the, where they are as a business and to use that to differentiate themselves. I mean, the simplest vision is that someone mentioned the word vision on the last panel is that you know the CEO comes into the office in the morning, switches on his digital dashboard, and sees yesterday's carbon footprint for his fleet and for each ship and notices that one master didn't have a very good day, you know. I mean, this is, I know Maersk is already doing this because Soren Sku told me he rings him up if he 
hears that a master's off his ordered schedule, he gives him a call, you know, so he says. Um, so I think really there is something out there which could help digitalization. I think that of all the things about digitalization about, is the one that might be most attractive. It could give you as a big company some real leverage, you know. Thank you. I mean, I think definitely, you know, even as lawyers, what we can't do is just do what we used to do. It doesn't happen that way because the business of our clients change. And, you know, Martin, you talk about, you know, customers looking for value add. It's no different to what my colleagues and I do. We can't just sit there and not change as their business change, as the regulations change. So, I mean, basic example, you know, having to, advising people who were looking into sort of projects involving Russia, we were advising a company and a bank separately on two matters that we're looking at in relation to Iran until, because of the uncertainty and comments coming out from the US, everything's stalled. And the uncertainty is something that we'll mention sort of uh, separately. And, you know, even regulatory changes and things like the, just the data protection and how does it affect you? It affects everybody. It's a pain. We've got to deal with it. And we have to be there to help our clients with how does this affect them and making sure they implement it properly because nobody wants to fall foul of sort of regulations. Um, Jeremy. You're with One Network Express, and that's basically an integration of the container operations for, initially, that's how it started, and you've got the sort of shipping, the line of business now as well, between NYK, K-Line, and MOL. Perhaps you could give us, for sort of your perspective, the, the benefits, the drivers behind that integration. Yeah, thank you, May. Um, so I, th I think on the, uh, don't have to push your buttons, do I? Or okay. Um, I think Martin's view, you know, I understand that on the conventional uh, bulk operation side and particularly the owner's side where there may be not so many uh, drivers or, or value propositions for mass consolidation. But uh, on the container side, I think it is different. Uh, container operators are, are, are owners and operators. Um, and their operation as we know, goes further than just the port port operation. It goes to terminals, it goes into inland. And uh, I think the comment was made earlier on uh, in, in, in this discussion this morning that you know, scale does matter. And it definitely matters in the container shipping business. Uh, you either these days have to be a, a global provider offering significant scale and significant range of services, or either you're in a niche uh, regional area well, you'll provide um, a very good local regional service to your customers. And, and there's not much room for, for the middle ground these days. And that's because, you know, scale is about slot cost. It is about having the, deploying the right ship types into the right trades. Um, it is, though, also about having this total global coverage. The customer, at the end of the day, wants one throat to choke. They want to deal with one party in 120 to 140 countries in the world in the same way, in the, in the same processes, same systems. And then on the land side, um, there are significant economies of scale by owning or operating your own terminals or being able to get bigger scale in terms of your trucking or your, or your rail operations. And of course, you've then got all your offices and, and staff as well. So there are big opportunities there in terms of scale. I think the second one is, is, is balance sheets. And again, as we referred to uh, in, in Martin's uh, chronology this morning, the industry's ups and downs, and we, we've come through a very tough time uh, with a lot of distress on the balance sheet and a need to tidy up. And the fact that um, you can't just keep bouncing along in a very distressed situation. And we all know on the container shipping side in 2016, the implications of when Hanjin went down, that you know, had, had major global implications for multiple stakeholders in the industry. So, you know, you do need to have a strong balance sheet these days to, to get through these difficulties. And, and if you are in a position where you're weak, sometimes getting together other parties, being able to clean up that balance sheet, write off a lot of debt, start afresh is also a benefit. I think the third area is, is really on forward investment. And we've always thought in the container shipping industry that investment is about the, buying the containers and buying the ships or leasing the ships. Um, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of future investment going to be needed in, in digital platforms. We talked about digitalization a lot today, in systems, in processes. 
but also in terms of the whole issue around fuel efficiency and going forward. And uh, the, the IMO January you know, 2020 really does kick off very soon. Uh, the move to, uh, to distillate fuels is, is really just a short-term issue. Um, you know, as Espen well, well explained just now, there's really two parts to the exam question. First of all, you've got to come up with a solution that gets you to January, safely through January 2020. But part two of the question is, is how do you then build a sustainable, uh, compliant uh, platform that takes you to 230, 250 onwards? And the, uh, the, the SOX IMO cap, yeah, that's great for taking sulfides out of the atmosphere, but it does absolutely nothing for fossil fuels. And so you've got to think about that as well. And we have to think about some significant investment going forward in terms of the technology and the fleet requirements. And uh, to do that as a single operator, relatively small scale, covers a lot of risk. So you need to, you need to be able to do that uh, with quite a lot of scale. And uh, maybe the last one and the interesting one that's just come up really on the surface is, is particularly on container shipping, are, are you just a container shipping operator? Or do you go into more vertical integration, which is what Maersk is now purporting to do to go into the 3PL area? Uh, you might have seen recently CMA's announcement to go take 25% equity in SIVA. So is, is, is the land side, logistics side also becoming part of the vertical integration story, in which case you would need even more scale and more integration? Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Nikos, I mean, we've heard at least two people, Jeremy and also the chap on the, on the early panel, saying size and scale does matter. Now, where does that leave the smaller players, not just in terms of the competition for business, but access to services? Um, you know. Yes, I, I, I believe and I agree with Jeremy that uh, in the, I would say, the high-end uh, side of uh, the demanding uh, uh, side of shipping, you know, be it containers, be it LNG, uh, be it tankers, I think it is very important, and the clients are looking for size. I mean, we, we look at it with the major oil companies. Uh, they want you to be a public company. They want uh, to, you know, to be of, of some size. Uh, however, I mean, shipping has to go on, and it goes on with startups. And um, the majority of the startups, I think, uh, will be coming initially from the bulk sector, which is really a much more Trump, uh, a much more uh, Trump, uh, Trump sector. Uh, the barrier of entrance is much, much lower uh, than the other sectors because we knew we need renew uh, re re uh, new players in the industry, as we call them, uh, startups. Uh, the most important thing, though, because the industry is very fragmented, is to be able to have uh, some sort of commercial consolidation. So, whereas, and I'm talking mainly on the on the bulk sector, whereas, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Martin said, you might have uh, an average fleet of five or, you know, uh, a sweet spot of 15 to 20 vessels, uh, it is a very, 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 very fragmented industry. The clients are much, much uh, less, and they have control. So I think commercial consolidation, uh, you don't have to put companies together. I think there's very, very little that it adds up to, but uh, you can have uh, pooling arrangements. Uh, so we, you know, we perso I personally and our operation supports the pools because it, uh, it has one, one, uh, one voice uh, towards, your, towards your clients. So whereas uh, I agree that on the higher end of the, of the business size matters, I think we still need the, the new guys and the smaller guys to come in that, that will grow the business. Thank you very much. We've got about just about uh, six minutes left. And I think the last area that I'd like to discuss, which um, I did mention at the beginning, was the uncertainty in terms of the political environment that does impact the um, the business that we're in. It's not just the sanctions. We've seen how that can create a problem. And it's not just when things change. It's when people don't know whether it will change and to what extent it will change because of a comment that's made. We've also seen the issues arising out of tariffs because of protectionist uh, policies. I understand that... Um, Recently, the U.S. has just imposed tariff on, tariffs on the import of steel <laughs> and aluminium. We've already seen the retaliation from China because of the tariffs 
and the policies being implemented in the US that you know, China decided to impose tariffs on uh, sort of soybean uh, imports from the US, regardless of whether or not they can source that from elsewhere, it impacts on the trade flows. Espen, I'd love to get your thoughts as to whether you've actually seen that the impact. How is that trans? Have you actually seen it translate into the the shipping industry so far? Um, I, I, apart from reading that there's been a, a drop off in soya bean exports from the U.S., I, actually I haven't seen or heard of any, um, apart from some anecdotal evidence that, that that anything has been affected as yet. I think the um, I, 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 my personal view is that. Ultimately, common sense will prevail, and a full-blown up scale, uh, a full-scale uh, trade war will be avoided. Because uh, I think it's just so obvious that that it is in no one's interest, and I think even uh, President Trump can can see that. Um, but I think he's going to play this um, as hard as he can and extract as much concession as he can. But ultimately, um, it it he will he will um, common sense will prevail. I think <coughs> the much bigger issue is that is that his apparent disdain for, uh, for, for, for institutions such as the WTO um, is quite well known and ideally the dispute that he has with China should go by the WTO. That's an established um, entity for this very purpose and I think that's much more the, the problem in a way than specific threats of this product or that product being, uh, being um, tariffed against and hopefully um, in this score as well, he, he will he will take the and use the WTO for the purpose for which it was established. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael. From the sort of banking side, I mean, how has that the uncertainty, the political environment, or you know the the changes in relation to sanctions? How, how how have you seen that impact on the business that you know City is able or a, not able um, to do the change of the focus? Well, I, 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 the broader sanctions issue is very complex for banks. As you know, the US dollar, <clears throat> if you use a single dollar in any transaction, directly or indirectly, with a sanctioned country, a company, or entity, it can be very, very fatal and cost a lot of money. So navigating through sanctions is difficult at the best of times. Um, I think in terms of the broader sort of trade, war, tariff issue, I, I think in a way, it's a good if it helps sort of calm ship owners down from ordering ships if there's a fear of trade being impacted, anything that dampens the enthusiasm for more capacity, as Martin showed us at the beginning, we've still got a lot of excess capacity to soak up. I, I think shipping has shown, and container shipping in particular, as you know, the box was the single, single largest contributor to growth in the developed world, developing world that shipping can come through this and, 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 and adapt. And what happens is trade moves from different places as long as what was interesting is the Americans talking about lifting sanctions on the aluminium producer if there are certain things done around the ownership because of the impact that has on the rest of the world. They over sort of over judged, if you like, the effect of just single individual Banks get round these things, but anything that makes it more difficult clearly will have a dampening effect. But I think the shipping industry uh, finds a way, and I think traders find a way of substituting where they can't buy or sell from one place to another, they'll find another source. Thank you. We've just got um, just over a minute to go. Um, Jeremy, could I just ask you, looking ahead, uh, if I could ask you to paint sort of a picture of what you would like the future of shipping? to look like? How would you describe it for the sector that you're in? Yeah, I think, um, I think we all in this room fully recognize the importance of shipping as a servant of global trade. Uh, we think the world's generally going in the right direction economically. Um, and uh, we are the engine, we are the supporters, we are the servant of that trade. And uh, I think we have to continue to make a strong argument that we are uh, an important stakeholder in, in supporting global trade. And uh, I'm a reasonably optimistic. I think that uh, school heads will prevail on the, all of this uh, issue about uh, trade sanctions, etc. I think uh, the economists' uh, arguments are very clear, very strong. A lot of the administration bureaucrats behind the politicians 
are pretty clear about the, 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 the clarity and the economics of what we're doing. Uh, we just have to try and get through some of these economic skirmishes that are going on. I think that's all they are. They're not going to get any more than that. And, uh, you know, the, the world is such an integrated part. I mean, just look at these mints on our table today. Uh, the, the actual mint is made in the USA. Uh, the, the tin is made, it says, in China. And here we have them in Singapore. That's just a perfect example of how integrated supply chains are, how much we need each other, how much the world needs shipping. It's a great industry. I think we're going to get through these problems. I'm very positive about the IMO decision, and I think we will make the world a better place. And shipping will be leading that and continuing to be a strong player with trade for many more years to come. So thank you. And make some money in the meantime. Because I think... Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll make be, a lot of money we'll, in the we'll meantime. Be, that would be very good. I don't know about a lot. For the time, for the time being, we're not making any. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, it's good to start making some money. Otherwise, you know, we can sit here, congratulate each other about what a great job we did with the IMO. <laughs> but the sustainability of the business is also very important. Okay, so let's not be too greedy. Let's make some money. If all goes well, we'll make a little bit more than some money. But uh, on that note, um, I'm Gomei Lin from Watson Farley Williams. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, Jeremy Nixon, Espen Paulson, Nikos Sarkos, Martin Stopford, and Michael Parker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.